morning, Charter folk. It's great to be with you. Um, this is Jed. I um, imagine by now that uh, viewers are aware that uh, I am very excited about Charter Folk. Um, I am very um, supportive of and impressed by Charter Folk. And my sense is that people that are working in our nation's charter schools, while we get things wrong and we have to keep improving, um, and yes, we love all educators and many others, um, there's something special about this group of people that are coming to work in our nation's charter schools, and they should be celebrated. And also, they are dealing with some of the most ridiculous blowback and unfair treatment. And if there's just one place in the world that can attempt to do honor to what we are uh, working on together, um, it will be of, of, of value. That's what I'm trying to do at Charter Folk. One of the things I've loved most about doing this is that it's given me a chance to reconnect with old friends who I've worked with for so long, but also to meet a bunch of new people. And uh, today's discussion is just a shining example of how Charter Folk has put me into contact with another group of just extraordinary people working in charter schools. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us Nella Garcia Urban. Um, and I think we'll bring Nella on right now. And I'll continue to just provide a little bit of context here about how um, both um, working with folks that I've known for a long time, as well as meeting a bunch of new people is really what makes me most excited about charter folk, because um, our board chair is Emilio Peck. Um, and uh, there are very few people in the world that I owe as much to as I do to Emilio. He's an extraordinary leader in Los Angeles um, at STEM Prep, doing an incredible um, uh, job with his schools, but also with advocacy. And as board chair, I turned to him and I said, hey, I'd love to hand the mic to you. What would you like to write about at Charter Folk? And he said, well, let me call Malka and I'll get right back to you. And Malka Borrego is another extraordinary leader from Los Angeles at Equitas. Um, who was on the board of the CCSA and another person to whom I owe a huge, huge uh, loyalty to and just never ending gratitude. Those two said, hey, we've got two other remarkable uh, Latino Latinas across the country that we'd like to write with. One is Nella Garcia Urban. Another one is Jennifer Lopez from Milwaukee. Um, and the four of us together want to write something about how we need to um, work harder at building Latino leadership in the movement because we've got a severe problem here and we're not making as much progress. And so um, together, those four writers posted this great piece that got so much response. And I've had so many people say, what are we doing next? What are we doing next? That uh, I reached out to Nella and said, hey, Nella, would you be willing to continue the conversation with me at a chat? And Nella said, yes. So that's why we have Nella here. Nella, thank you so much for being here. Delighted to have to have you here with us today. Hi, Jed. I am just as uh, thrilled to have an opportunity to talk with you about this incredibly important conversation and issue that we are facing as charter leaders and charter networks. Thank you so much for having me. Just really um, excited to have you. So thanks again. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about um, your background um, and where you um, where you grew up? how you ended up at YES, your extraordinary story within YES, um, also just the work that you're doing across the entire movement um, to try to help um, grow a new generation of, of Latino leadership. Well, my story begins in the Rio Grande Valley on the U.S.-Mexico uh, border, where my family has been for generations. I grew up in rural Texas, and um, while our culture was incredibly rich in so many different aspects, educational opportunity at the time was not one of those aspects. Um, today, there are some incredible charter networks and really strong public school districts in the Rio Grande Valley that I'm very proud of. But at the time, um, I didn't have the same access to a really excellent college-ready education. Um, but what I did have was a passion for community and culture and our collective power in, in pride in who we are. I became a Houstonian via Rice University, where I became hyper aware of how different I was, not just different in the sense 
of my background and ethnicity, while that was a major difference, there were very, very few Latinos um, at a predominantly white and Asian institution um, in the early 2000s. Um, but I was different because I didn't have the same level of access to college ready um, K through 12 education. I was highly underprepared. And at first I started to feel a lot of shame about that. And I had a lot of questions about whether or not I was smart enough and whether or not I was good enough. And because Rice University is hyper-focused on issues of equity and understanding the world's problems, I started to learn that it was actually systems of oppression that were the driver of why I was so underprepared for a tier one university. Um, that led me to um, become passionate about educational equity. And I um, fell in love with a charter network called Yes Prep because I was visiting via an internship that I had and I had never seen anything like it. I had never seen such an intense focus and um, fostering of a culture of achievement. Um, in my educational experience, our culture was really driven by the communal aspects of school, like sports and um, the different activities that made us come together as a community, which on one hand was a really beautiful thing, but I had never seen this like this beauty and this like joy in learning. And of course, I just went, fell head over heels in love with it and couldn't get it out of my mind and in my heart. And so a year into law school quit to become a teacher because I knew that is what I, I was destined to do and became a teacher, ended up becoming a school leader, um, eventually opened and led the very first alternative certification program in the state of Texas run by a charter school teaching excellence, which today has produced hundreds of high quality teachers of color, um, became a chief talent officer to really like drive um, equity based talent strategy start to finish. And then four years ago, um, transitioned into a role as our chief program officer, where I lead college ready programming pre-K through 12 um, for every single student in our network. Uh, well, it's an <clears throat> awesome story. Um, a lot of it I want to just dive right back into. Um, <laughs> but, but let's just keep the, the forward momentum just for a second, because I'd like to just to ask you, when you and Emilio and, and Malka and Jennifer first got together, did you know already what you wanted to write about? Um, what was it that sparked exactly that subject? Um, I'd be just curious what the origins were and what the beginnings of your guys' conversation was on, on, on the piece. Well, the four of us have known each other for a number of years, thanks to um, Charter School Growth Fund, who has brought leaders of color together um, prior to the pandemic. And so obviously, we've like gravitated towards each other. And the origin of that piece truly starts with a massive problem. And that massive problem is the undereducation of Black and Latino students in this country. And when we look at where like the end goal, which for many of us is college access and opportunity for higher education, we are seeing that not only in this pandemic, but also pre-pandemic, Latino students specifically do not have access to college opportunity in the same way that other students do. And so like that's, that's the origin of, of our commentary, because at the end of the day, we believe that in order to address the fact that um, far fewer Latino students have access to college or are graduating from college and thereby changing the trajectory of not only their lives, but their families' lives, we know it needs to be a multi-tier strategy. Um, charter schools are one aspect of that strategy, but the leader at the helm of any district, regardless of what category it falls in, is the leader. The leader is that unit and catalyst of change. And we believe that when more Latino leaders are at the helm and at the decision making table in whatever way possible, we know that we are going to bring the fullness of our experience, the knowledge and context of our culture and a perspective that is going to elevate the opportunity for our students. At this moment in time, in any industry in this country, 
four percent of la- of executives are Latino. Four. Yeah. Like we're not even in a double digit. And um, that, 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 that's a problem because we are growing in number. Um, we are a young minority group. We are the largest minority group. And so we do need to ensure that, that we are putting um, our voices um, at the table so that we can support um, students in our communities and every single student that comes through our doors. Can you um, uh, amplify the the theme of, of where the the challenges in leadership specifically come from, you know, within our within our movement. Um, I I consider myself really interested in these in these issues. Um, I've had an obsession with charter schools for a long time. I did my teaching in South Los Angeles. Ninety eight percent of you know my the kids that I taught uh, uh, were Latino. Um, and yet, when I got to the role at, at, at CCSA, um, some of the data that just most shocked me was that we actually had a significant underrepresentation of Latino students in the charter school sector. And with about 50% of, of, of students in, in California were Latino, and only 40% of charter school students were. And I was like, whoa, what are we doing? And then to look at what the representation was of Latinos in leadership, right? And in our teaching fields, but I just didn't know. I didn't know. Um, and so um, I guess, could you just share with us? And, and now I realize that my California lens hasn't actually been that useful in terms of looking at the whole national piece. And yet you've been thinking about this and connected to charter growth to national issues for quite a while. Can you just share what the status is and, and any other comments about what we're doing right or wrong as it relates to cultivating Latino leadership? Yes. And I, I think that um, as a charter sector, there are efforts that we need to make. And I also think within our own community, there are efforts that we need to make. I think first and foremost, um, a piece that that you actually wrote on Charter Folk about following up on our article really highlighted this. So I want to reemphasize that, which is like, we do need to be aware of the data. And the reason why, and data is absolutely critical in every single aspect of our work when it comes to driving student outcome and creating a change. But in this particular scenario, I do think it's incredibly important to highlight it because so often um, our community receives messages, whether those be direct or indirect, that we should remain invisible. And when you highlight the data, when you really like look at the disparity, it stuns you. Um, So I think that's first and foremost, like an incredibly important thing. Um, I think that the second thing that we need to do as a charter sector is really focus on not settling. Like, um, you know, we just got a very big appointment, um, you know, a Latino leader, secretary of education, which is very exciting. And we need to hold him accountable. Like, let's talk about options that work. Let's talk about every single family having the opportunity to make a choice about the most important decision that they are ever going to make, which is the education of their child. Um, so, you know, I, I first and I truly believe like we can't settle in the charter sector. Um, we have to keep pushing. Um, we have to push on any equity gap that we're seeing. And this this is, I believe, is one of them, just like we want to push for um, you know, full transparency about how different subgroups are doing academically or who's accessing college and who's not. Like who's at the table also really matters when it comes to driving those outcomes. I think in terms of what we need to do as a community ourselves is that we really have to break out of any cultural mindsets that are hindering our leadership. Um, I think we need to reframe the concept of humility, which can be core um, to who we are at times. We need to reframe that to servant leadership, true leadership in our communities. And we need to be unafraid and we need to be unapologetic about who we are and what we bring to the table. And I know that can be very complex to be unafraid given the messages that our community has received um, over generations, really. 
but but we do have to stand up and and mobilize towards efforts that are going to ensure that we have equitable access in this country to the opportunities that are going to create life changing trajectories. So I like um, uh, all that you've just said. A, a lot of it also seems to be on um, on Latinos and Latinas yourselves to yeah. <laughs> get this you have greater strength and 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 which I think is super important. But for organizations um, mm-hmm. uh, that are attempting to also be good allies, are good partners. You know, mm-hmm. can, can you identify some things? And also, I have to say. Yes is impressive for so many different things, but yes is also impressive in that they found found you, and they've known that they've had a great leader in you. And and and, but it's not just you, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. There's a leadership, there's a leadership uh, team at uh, Yes that is uh, very diverse, and so clearly yeah. Yes is doing some things. So can you just identify from a from an organizational standpoint, maybe from a movement standpoint, what are the things that we can be doing that 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 help? And if you're aware of anything that you know trips things up and you know we're mm-hmm. continuing to screw things up, I'd love it if you would surface that for our for our viewers as well. Well, thank you for um, recognizing how the diversity and the, the power of diversity in our executive team. Um, I believe that is an aspect of our strength. As an organization, I was part of a series when former Secretary of Education Arne Duncan was in his seat and it was called Our Students, Our Leaders. And the purpose was to bring together leaders of color to talk about issues of diversity, equity, and social justice in serving black and Latino students in this country. And in his welcoming address to this incredible room of people, he said very directly, if your CEO or your superintendent does not have diversity, equity, and social justice work in their top three priorities, like this is not going to move, it's not going to move the needle. And I would say that at Yes Prep, our CEO, Mark Tabella, does have um, equity at our core and as a major driver of all of our decisions, which I believe has attracted leaders of color to our our, our work. Um, you know, our, our entire organization has completely changed and which was one of my main goals um, as, as the first chief talent officer of the organization. So I'm very proud of that, but like, that's why you, it has to be your priority. Um, I, I'm noticing equity becoming a buzzword and that makes me incredibly yeah. nervous because yeah. buzzwords come and go. And this is like work that has to stand the test of time and really be embedded into undoing policies that don't work, into determining who gets to the table, and to cultivating leaders from start to finish. So a couple of other things on your uh, on your question. One, I believe fully in the power of programming. Obviously, that's my title, Chief Program mm-hmm. Officer. Yep. But the investment, the investment in the development of Latino leaders and early, the earlier the better, as earlier as possible, um, it makes a huge difference. And there are organizations that are working towards this, like Latinos for Education, the Surge Institute, um, Edlock, mm-hmm. of which I'm a member. We mm-hmm. have to continue to invest in that programming. Like as I sit here on this call, like I am a recent graduate of the Broad Academy. And I am a better, fiercer, more equity-driven leader as a result of the investment that the Bro Network poured into me. And I believe I'm I'm stronger for my students as a result of that investment. That makes a difference because mm-hmm. we may not have the same access that other leaders. You know, one of the things, reasons why Emilio Malka and Jennifer and I have become so close is because we can pick up the phone, right, and say hey, I really need help with this, Nella. You have a bigger network. You've done this longer. Like, can you help me? And I can say, absolutely. Like that, that is that is like a power that we need to continue to leverage. And then secondly, we need sponsorship over mentorship. There's a huge difference. Hmm. And I just call on any leader watching this, find a leader of color that you can sponsor. What does sponsor mean? It means that you give an opportunity to that leader to come with you to a meeting, to speak in your stead, to take on a new project with you in the background, 
coaching to introduce them to a funder or a board member to make a connection that's going to mobilize their career. We have amazing mentors. We need sponsors. And again, I sit on this call because of the sponsorship of people who did not look like me and people who did that, that gave me an opportunity to showcase what I can do. And now I'm able to drive change for 16,000 kids in Houston and hopefully beyond. Again, I've got like six things I want to go back to. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just choose. I'll just choose one of them. Um, okay. Um, uh, separate to this call, I was mentioning how my my wife is a clinical psychologist, and she did her research on the imposter phenomenon. She was the first researcher, I believe, that studied the impact of the phenomenon on women of color. Um, and there's just so much interesting stuff that came out of her research um, that's been a useful lens for me. One of the things that uh, she she identified was the importance of college networks, you know, or teenage early twenties networks um, that end up being of great assistance to people later in their careers when they find moments where they feel doubt. You know, who do they call? They call, yes. and this is why one of the things she specifically identified is you know why the divine nine matters so much to African American professional uh, development, right? Um, and you were talking about, you know, some things that had happened earlier in your career. You're talking about relationships that you formed with uh, other Latinos and Latinas earlier in, in life and then how you call back. them. Are there things uh, that we can be doing, you know, for those for those teachers? You're talking about you're running one of the first teacher credentialing programs, right? I mean, the people I went through my teacher credentialing program just last week, one of us, one turned 50 years old and we and, and several of the people in the credentialing program, we all got married, right? <laughs> <laughs> and now we stay together for it with each other, That's right? Incredible. So when you're thinking about yes, you're thinking about teacher development, you're thinking about you know er, early stage things that we can be doing that can pay dividends down the road. Anything that you can throw in about you know strategies that would help our organizations get smarter about this stuff? I think that all um, organizations, from a talent perspective, need to prioritize relationship building as a, an end of itself but also as a lever for coaching and opportunity. I think that those two things are really important. Additionally, from a talent strategy perspective, pipelining for, uh, for cultivating talent and leaders is absolutely critical. Um, just to touch back on sponsorship as a connection to this yeah. story, my, um, my boss, when I became a CTO, he sponsored me to start my own board committee, which was the Human Capital Committee. And I was terrified to lead that group of very experienced um, men yeah, with one incredible woman um, board. And But he supported and sponsored me to do that. And through that committee, an amazing connection for an executive from ConocoPhillips. And then he made a connection to me for the chief of HR for ConocoPhillips, who gave me two hours of her time and taught me this incredible pipelining strategy of how very early on, literally from the most emergent job in their organization, they start pipelining leaders, diverse leaders, leaders for different positions, so that they have an amazing trajectory to internal leadership in their most important core business functions. Um, and I'm like, this is like something that school systems need to be replicating. Like, how are you finding like pockets of performance, like fostering that? Um, and the reason why this is really important to the Latino leader conversation is that oftentimes like we are doubting our abilities more than the world around us. So we're not showing up to the opportunity. And that means something we need to do. But what I also say that organizations need to do is that, you know, we're, we always talk about, well, we want a diverse portfolio when you bring the candidates. I don't want that at the final stage. I want that at the very beginning of cultivation. What did the pipeline look like at the start of selection? Did we go out and have at least three cultivation conversations for every one diverse candidate that we want? That's what's going to start changing this trajectory, because until we start fighting that imposter syndrome and putting our hat in the ring and truly showing up for those roles, then we've got to 
there, we've got to have organizations that, that um, are putting in that effort on the front end as well. Yeah, I think that um, uh, as somebody that was the lead ex executive for an organization for 10 years, hey, <clears throat> we got some things right and, and we screw some things up for sure. Um, I know that like one, uh, and this was always important to me from the very beginning. Um, I love your sponsorship. I love the sponsorship versus mentorship. That's really helpful. Love that language. I also know <clears throat> that earlier on in my leadership, um, thinking about individual Latino or Latina leaders um, and really getting the supports to them was key, but also it allowed, it allowed me to make the error of narrowing, you know, and putting a lot of chips in just like a, a, a one basket, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. then not everyone works. And then you result at the end, when you want that diverse pipeline, it's not there, right? And yeah. so, you know, what I realized was, I just needed to be doing a lot more in terms of like cloud development, right? Like really working on making sure there's a large number, right? And then look, it's some folks are going to really succeed and some folks are, are, are not going to because it's human, right? But if you've made the overall investment in the general, what you have mm -hmm. at the end, you know, is this, is this talent pool that will ultimately really thrive. Um, so I, I, I just wondered, do you think, in terms of advocacy, you know, um, we're talking a lot about school leadership and that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. My own opinion is that our DEI problems in advocacy are worse than they are elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And I can tell you, aside from Myrna right now, at, at, at my old job, you know, we I don't believe we have a single Latino or Latina leading a state association. Um, uh, I just have been recruiting a table of of a dozen people who are serving as the leads in the our, our, the, the, the legislature's leading state advocacy work. We have one Latina, one, right? Uh, we have we have six African Americans, you know, and we have you know three or four white. Of course, there's a, a a pool of white people that are far larger there, right? Yeah. But you can see, I almost feel like our advocacy problems, uh, as far as DEI goes. Are are more pronounced, uh, and this is one of the things that you guys talked about in your in your piece, which I really love, which is the importance of the support organizations, and that th they've got to really take this stuff seriously at new levels. I think Charter Growth is is an example of one that's that's done it well. But do you want to just talk about you know either advocacy or support organizations generally what they need to be doing uh, in this in this area? Thank you for sharing that. And I, I agree with you. I think that advocacy needs to reflect community because one of the greatest purposes of advocacy is to voice the choice, the like the desire of a community. And there's something problematic about representation of that collective voice without some version of connection to that. Um, and so I, I appreciate you raising that. And I, I believe that there have to be co-conspirators like yourself in positions to support, but when possible, um, leaders need to mobilize themselves to those positions just in the vein of, of servant leadership. And, and I hope that that type changes as we've seen more, um, a few things, right? Like more, um, Latino lawmakers like running for office, um, as well as a greater Latino voting bloc. Um, we are a massive one. We are also not monolithic. Um, and so I think that those two things should hopefully start to drive some change in the diversification of the advocacy work. Um, in terms of other support networks and ways that we can be supportive to this issue is I believe strongly we need to hear from our alumni. Um, there are thousands of Latino students that have gone through the charter school process and we need to hear about their positive and negative experiences. Like not just like, let's get on a stage and talk about how this particular school gave you an opportunity. And now you're in, you know, you've been able to change your life circumstances. Like I want to hear those stories as much as possible because they inspire me and they, they give me the fortitude to keep going during a time like this. But I also want to know, like, how did we, impose assimilationist beliefs on you like how do we need to do better as as a network and I think that's an important piece too 
Um, I think that every support org and charters together, we need to use like equity driven design thinking strategies for everything we do because it starts with empathy interviews and they take a lot of time, but community and efficiency live on different poles in the executive's compass and like truly like a value and a protection for diversity means that we also you know, ground ourselves in that value of community. And, and I do believe we need to also focus on empowerment versus education. So much in advocacy and support networks, what it's doing is like, oh, we just need to like educate. We need to, our, our families don't know, but we're not really thinking about what their asset is either. Um, and so when we reframe empowerment versus like telling people something, I think we're actually going to see a force far greater than we can even imagine for the benefit of our kids. Howard Fuller, I'm not sure if you saw his uh, chat, um, but near the end, I, I asked him, what are we screwing up on, on DEI? And, <laughs> and, and, and you know, where did it start from? And he really talked about a particular moment when funders decided to really focus on the mm-hmm. large CMOs mm-hmm. um, and how once that bet was made, it didn't it didn't start to, to be racially insensitive or culturally insensitive in its motivations, but that's what the implications were because the smaller organizations didn't get funded and the smaller organizations were the ones that were more typically led by people of color. And so you magnify it out 10, 12 years later. And fortunately, Charter Growth is one of the first organizations that really starts to pivot to make something different. Um, I think that this can, you know, same kind of, uh, you know, d- just the errors in in how we do our work foundationally ripple through and have those bad impacts. Like I'm thinking about, you're talking about empowerment. I I think that, you know, it, when it comes to advocacy and and you know the governance of our our our, our charter organizations, who has the power? Who is sitting on the boards? Right. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a significant number of Latino and African-American or whatever the representation is that you think reflects the the community that you're serving and your ambitions, then something is fundamentally askew. If you Mm -hmm. have a political machine that you're building, you're wanting to have parents and, and alumni really get involved in it. Right. But you haven't given them governance control. Or at least governance input, right? The endorsement decisions. Who's deciding? Which Mm -hmm. is it? Just is it just three white guys up in you know living in Sacramento (laughs) and state capitals that point around and say we're going to endorse this person? Okay, now everybody go and like go out in precincts and walk and phone bank for that kind of. Have we built the structures that we need, Mm -hmm. right, such that people authentically um, own the decision? But then once they own the decision, they develop the expertise and they're ready to then take even more responsibility going forward. Mm -hmm. And I just think there are just so many things like this where if we really deconstructed our experience, we we would realize that, you know, we need to be doing, you know, some of this foundational work differently. Well, I think what you're saying illuminates the fact that systems are designed like they're working exactly how they were designed to work. (laughs) <laughs> and you're talking about breaking the design yeah. driven by equity, which is the work that all of us are called to do at a huge scale, like what you're talking about when it comes to governance or driving state policy on how equitably or uh, um, how the access that the charter networks have and, and children have to charter schools. But it's also in the microcosm of like the day to day conversations that schools and their teachers have with their parents, like it's designed to work a certain way and and it works like that, right? Um, And the reality is that for many of us, like we are trying to change and access systems that were not designed for us. Um, The very mission of so many charter networks is to actually access and democratize a system that was designed to keep us out. Um, and so until we change that design and the, um, and your example is very analogous to this, like we're, we're actually not going to see the type of change that we need well, we have I, to be willing I, to change it. I mean, in, in doing homework for this interview, I've, you know, I've watched uh, the YouTubes that I can find in the Facebook you know, the interviews and those kinds of things. One of them I love was, uh, when you're talking, you're in, in, in the in, in front of the whiteboard, you know, with with the yes information behind oh, you, yes. you know, I love that. Choice week. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly, exactly. But you also you were just talking about, you know, every kid, mm-hmm. every kid, right? 
And I can just imagine, you know, what every kid means yeah. can be different, right? And, you know, if, if we need to make a decision about are we going to serve absolutely all children, and you're talking about the additional efforts that you make for kids with um, disabilities and all sorts of other things, right? I can imagine the the board and the executive team will make a decision about what yes, every kid means that would be very different than, let's say, a, a an advocacy organization that had on its board um, not nearly the same representation, right? We're going to yeah. make fundamentally different decisions. And this is how we end up going in different directions and why we have to redouble our efforts to make sure that we get uh, people like you, Nella, you know, on every single advocacy board or wherever <laughs> we can, you know, so that your voice can not just be heard, but can be reflected in the decisions that, that we ultimately make. Thank you for saying that. Something in our organization that we have held very near and dear since we really started changing the the core of who we are towards equity centered design is that all means all. And so we're fighting this belief that in our charter network, we don't take every single student or that our students um, we help them opt out of our process or that we don't offer certain services. And we made a fundamental decision like that would no longer be us. And we set persistence goals and be, have beaten our persistence goals ever since. Persistence meaning our students are staying with us. Um, and, you know, to any organization that wants to say like all kids, like every single kid, like I think there are ways that you can evaluate that. I think you can determine like how, where your investments are. Like, I, you know, I always say we can afford whatever we want. It just depends on what we're willing to trade off. And we've made trade-offs to ensure that we open programming to ensure that if a student makes a choice that's regrettable to them and their family, that they never actually have to leave. Yes, prep. We run our own alternative and restorative center so that our students aren't expelled and can like have the counseling and coaching and family supports to then come back into their school community. So they never have to feel the shame of being like, exited from something that they care about. Um, mm. So, you know, that that's like one example of how we've like put our resources in alignment with like every single kid. And you're right. Like the drivers of that are leaders that are equity driven and many of whom are leaders who have experienced things in their own families. And, and I can also say that for our board, um, our board is diverse. Our board is representative um, of our community in lots of different ways. We have an alumna on our board, um, we are so proud to see that um, because it also helps hold us accountable, not just for mm -hmm. our um, Latino students, but our black students as well. We have one of the most like respected community leaders in the black community and on our board. And, and he um, is such an asset because he shares with us like the where, what the messages, how the messages are landing, like how we can better support black boys, how we can ensure that black families trust us with their children. Um, so I believe that that diversity um, and creating a space where it's truly valued um, actually leads to change. Mm -hmm. Let me ask your advice about um, how charter folk most helps. Um, you know, one of the things I was worried about in terms of doing this with uh, uh, with, with your guys' first piece is you can convey a sense it's like a one and done, right? And I really didn't want that to happen. And and hopefully we're continuing the conversation going. Um, I was also a little bit, I'll say, I was a little bit a little bit concerned about writing a one right after you guys, right? Which is like, um, hey, this is a story for you guys to to, to really share. But I do have some experiences. I do have some observations. So I try to throw them in there. But can you just give just general coaching suggesting a suggestion about how charter folk uh, continues to um, uh, support on this really critical issue? I think that um, elevating voices is incredibly important because it models to everyone in our community, not only families, but students, early career leaders, that our stories do matter. Um, in a climate in which people believe that they need to change who they are to be successful, 
Um, an important statistic is that more Latino leaders than any other minority group believe they need to assimilate to succeed. That means they need to sh sh um, cloak their identity in order to be successful and to have an opportunity to drive decision making. The reality is, is like when you change when you're when you change who you are to get to the table. When you get to the table, it's not going to be any easier to share your authentic perspective. And so when we elevate voices, when any one of us has an opportunity to tell our story, and when we receive sponsorship from a leader like yourself with experience in one of the largest charter communities in the country under immense pressure as well um, from a charter space, like it's, it communicates something. We're paying attention. When I see Daniela Anello, like on Charter Folk, mm. talking about bilingualism, like one of the, the, the aspects of our education that has been fully oppressed, um, mm. it tells me I can keep fighting for resources for bilingual education. I can keep advocating even though it's harder to find teachers. And it means that we have to have two different curricula. And it means that we've got to, you know, uh, train our, our assistant principals differently like that. None of that matters because at the end of the day, I'm listening to a person who's literally an expert on this talking about how it's like absolutely critical for the, the academic success of our children and their social, social, emotional well-being. Like, so just that profile, like communicated something to me and it probably communicates even more to other people. Um, we are a people, we are a community that we thrive off our connection to each other. And the more that that is like elevated and visible and the more that an organization like Charter Folk can sponsor that, um, you're, we're going to see momentum. And, and that is that is ultimately what we need to continue to change this problem. Well, Nella, just uh, consider um, an open invitation. You know, if there's something that... <laughs> There's something that I get wrong or there's something, an opportunity we're not taking advantage of or whatever, beat on me mercilessly. Um, and meanwhile, you know, Emilio and, and you know, our room of our, our really remarkable board will, you know, be of uh, assistance as well. But this, I fundamentally believe that, uh, I mean, if there's something that we learn coming out of this horrible story in, in Ogden, Utah, you know, about yeah. uh, it just to me says, look, we have got to grow a new generation of leadership such that just broadly, we are just more attuned, right? Yeah. Um, and we're supported by advocacy organizations that can help people in difficult moments, right? Um, but you have to have that next generation of leadership. And I'm going to do whatever I can here at Charter Folk to try to help Thank that you. happen. Um, Thank you. I, I, I want to say one thing that you reminded me about that story. Like a thing, thing we have to continue to do, especially amongst Black and Latinx or Latino leaders, is we have to bridge and we have to bridge towards each other and we have to continue to find like that connection so that collectively we're able to share and elevate our voices around um, inadequacies in the in the educational access of black and Latinx children. Um, and, and I and I'm really proud to be part of Edlock, which is an organization that that is the very fiber of who we are is bridging and connecting and finding like ways to to harness our collective power in advocacy of a third way. Um, so I think charter folk could could also contribute in that way amongst like the different groups like you're 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 a natural unifier, like a natural connector. And um, we can say like we need more um, Latinx leadership. And we can also say that like charters need to do better um, um, supporting black students. Like both of those things can be true. And how can like our solutions support all of um, those groups and ultimately drive our liberation? I remember when I um, was reading Taylor Branch's um, history of, of the of the United States during the Martin Luther King years, you know, it's it's a difficult thing for him. His, here's a white man writing that book, right? Um, and I found in one of the introductions, I think it was Parting the Waters, it might have been Pillar of Fire, but he was talking about the summary of American history. And what he found most compelling about the United States was that its ability for self-correction, right? Mm. And, and now whether the correction's happening fast enough, we don't know. But if you look at where it was, 
you know, where it's gotten to, hey, it's proven ability, right? And it's one of the things I think about the charter school movement too. It's just, we've got this ability to get better and to correct our own problems, right? Yes. But I don't think that we get better without intention. I don't, Mm -hmm. and and maybe one thing I'll at least, you know, Mm -hmm. claim a little bit of credit for it at CCSA, when when it was 50-40 kid representation and a complete and utter dearth in Latino leadership, um, we at least said, no, no, we're going to try and do something about this, right? And we didn't make it far enough. We didn't make it nearly far enough. But at least we made some progress. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at, at Charter Folk, I'm just going to try and bring the same spirit and, and you know, look to, to be made smarter by folks like yourself along the way. Thank you. Intentionality, as you mentioned, is a powerful tool for an organization and for a leader. And I, and I want to comment on what you said about, like, charter schools have this ability to improve. That's, you're absolutely right. That's the fiber of who we are. I think that a lot of districts, um, both public and charter, really rose to the occasion during this pandemic. But I have heard from leaders in education say, like, charters were just like very well positioned to execute, even in very low tech environments, even in like, you know, these different situations. And like, if anything, that moment is a reminder to us that like, we can change. And I do believe that many networks are putting anti-racism, you know, front and center on their priorities. And what I hope that we do not do is that we don't create a checklist of like what we need to <laughs> what we need to execute on in order to be done, because this this work is not done. We need the intentionality of a sustained effort here. Um, a lot of things are going to come our way. Uh, post pandemic, we're going to be looking at student data that is literally going to break our hearts over and over again, given what many of us like yourself and so many others have been working towards for decades, it is going to hit us. And it's going Mm -hmm. to be hard. But what we have to do is maintain the intentionality that like at the core of anti racism and at the core of, of educational equity is continual effort for the children that need us the most. Nella, um, I could keep talking about this, but we're, 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 get, we're getting near the end. Um, we are. I, I want to have just a, a chance also to connect this discussion to some of the broader themes at, at CCSA. Or it's, yes, I'm good. There, there I go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At the char- <laughs> I haven't done that in a long time. Wow. It, it'll at, creep up at, on you. <laughs> at, at Charter Folk, which is, um, you know, uh, this idea that uh, we, the role of charter schools is to make our public education system greatly more public for all, Mm -hmm. or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, to realize that, you know, greatly more public schools have a, a Maslow needs hierarchy that's properly structured with our values at the bottom. And, Mm -hmm. and, and and if we have things out of whack, as I believe the traditional public school system does, uh, we have severe problems. Um, I just wonder, are there any of the themes that you've seen highlighted here at Charter Folk that you that have particularly resonated with you? Uh, anything that seemed off off the mark? Uh, would love to hear just your general uh, impressions as a reader about what we're getting right and what we're getting wrong here at Charter Folk. I wanted to comment on the public schools piece in that I think that we need to continue that conversation over and over again because this concept that we're not public schools for whatever reason is hurting our movement. And um, traditional districts and portfolio models need to be part of this solution for, for all kids. A big issue that we have in this country is that we just don't think of all children as all of our children. And I believe that there are enough sponsors and supporters of charter networks that have actually rejected that idea. They've actually said, no, like the children of Houston are actually like my responsibility too. And I'm forever indebted to those supporters because that's why we're here. Um, So I think, I think we need to keep talking about that. Like I appreciate that, that conversation, like framing us as public schools because we are, but also like making those connections and understanding like what are the different options here? Um, that are that are going to get us to where where we need to go because reality is like we're serving a, thousands of kids we need to serve more but we're not going to get to all of them and so like what role do we play I think we play an incredibly powerful role so I appreciate that 
I also uh, commented on uh, the piece on Daniela, and I would love to encourage that a part as well around um, different value and program models in education. I'm incredibly fearful about um, decisions that are going to be made in the spirit of getting back to certain test scores that may not actually be the beneficial to our children in the long term. Um, we've made a lot of strides. We were slow to this. So just a couple of ideas for charter folk from the academic angle. You know, we've been slow to like the adoption of prepared curriculum generally as, as a sector. Um, and I'm even more nervous about that as we enter post pandemic era schooling where we need to accelerate learning in a very meaningful way. And um, I'd love to see continual conversation because part of our advocacy arm is our proof point. And mm -hmm. when our proof point is at risk, what do we do? We're going to try and protect it. And we're going to be under immense scarcity in certain scenarios, right? I think a lot of us are preparing for that. And so how do we operate in that? Like, and how do we maintain that North Star? Because if our North Star is still like opportunity for every single student that attends our charter schools, like we, we've got to hold strong on, on um, what made us great to begin with. And that might not be abandoning um, those, those tenants for a quick fix. So a couple ideas on places to continue that conversation. Cause I think people are just going to be, people are hungry right now, even to start thinking about what the future is going to look like. Right. Well, that's, um, very helpful. I think that that notion that, um, our public school system has not turned out to be as public as we need it to be. Um, and the role of charter schools is first to model what greatly more yes. public schools look like, right? Yes. And if we can't model it, then we have nothing, right? But then once I we have totally something, agree. once we have it, right, then the question is, did we do, did we work on this just for ourselves? Or did we work on this so that it would become a force strong enough that we can get it for absolutely all kids? The yes, the yes number, the absolutely every, it was, that's the language, every kid, absolutely, all yes. means all, all. All right? means all. And that is a tension, right? Because it's like, how do we like stay, how do we achieve something that so many districts can't achieve, but then also somehow spread our best practices, right? And, and what some people are not willing to do um, and, and that some people are just not willing to say, like, we are going to become an anti increasingly anti-racist organization. Well, what does that mean then for the black children that attend your schools who are going to thrive in an anti-racist society? Like, yeah, so I, I think I think there's a tension with that, but yet still this responsibility. So I think that's a charter folk could be interestingly positioned with the advocacy experience to figure out how we bridge those connections because yeah. No one's like against public school, <laughs> but right. but it's like they, they try and like separate us so as a means to oppress like our policy. And right. it's it's impacting actual kids and families, which is why people like you and I get riled up. <laughs> well, one of the things I got have to do at Charter Folk is just to pass the mic. We've just got a couple minutes left. A last okay. moment of passing the mic to you. Any last thing you wanted to share with our viewers? Uh, on whatever the topic may be. Now, I've enjoyed our time together and would love to hear whatever closing thoughts you might have. Thank you. Well, I would love to say to any um, charter supporters or leaders that have joined us today, regardless of your background, I would love to charge you to use your seat um, to advance social justice for every single kid. I would charge you to look with intentionality at every space that you're in and contribute. Contribute in a way that advances equity for every single kid. Now more than ever, there are children who want to thrive and their access to the education that will allow them to do that has been limited. And they are going to need leaders to step up for them. They're going to need charter advocates to fight harder, smarter, and with greater purpose towards our recovery and acceleration post-pandemic. 
Thank you all for your time and for listening to us today. And we hope that we've made you an even greater zealot for the work of charter schools. Let's just end it with that. Nella, thank you so much. <laughs> thank really you, Jen. enjoyed our time together. I look forward to staying in touch with you. Same. This was an incredible close to the week. Bye-bye now.